Chris Kelly on here for Hobby Game Dev. Thanks for tuning in today. We'll be talking about using PHP and PHP MyAdmin and MySQL to do some really basic database manipulation. This is pretty introductory stuff as these technologies go. As my tutorials often do, I'm sort of fairly skimming the surface of complexity for what these are capable of, but I'm trying to get you from a situation where you've got maybe no background with it or just little familiarity to a point where you're then ready to, anytime you find other online tutorials or example code, you can kind of wrap your mind around it more easily, integrate it into a foundation that you're able to lay for what we're going to cover today. So the things we'll be covering specifically are beginning with setting up your PHP website to base online and a, a PHP MyAdmin MySQL setup. That's unfortunately actually kind of open-ended because I don't want to railroad you into my particular service of choice. The second part will be showing how to use PHP MyAdmin to manually fill in values on a database and manipulate and browse for those entries. The third part will be using a form in PHP to input values into the database. And then the fourth or the final part will be looking at how to use a PHP file to organize and list an output of information from the database, covering what you need to be set up, how to get something in place in the database so we can manipulate it, and how to manipulate that database and how to expose values from it. So at the end part, we'll be covering some really basic SQL query commands that we use through the PHP to collect, access, and update values in that database. I always like to try to address why we're learning something as opposed to just running into it. PHP is useful for generating dynamic web pages. It's effectively a programming language that generates HTML. HTML, of course, being the language for, for most of how the web works. MySQL is the database flavor of choice for a lot of situations. It scales well, and it deals with large amounts of information very efficiently if you need to sort through different types of user accounts, different types of user-generated content they've submitted through various other types of data your game may want to reference that's changeable. Sort of, a, it's the internet age equivalent of data files. So for starters, unlike the previous tutorials I've given, you will, for this one, need some sort of space online already. You can't really start from scratch so easily unless you've got the option you could locally install a PHP and SQL database setup. That's a little more advanced than what I'm covering here. That's something you might do if you're on a full-scale development team to be able to test and iterate locally. For a lot of what we actually wind up doing for the lower scale, especially for prototyping, is you'll just be working directly on an FTP space for an outside server. So if you don't have a server yet, it, so first of all, if, if you're with a university, you probably actually do have web space that's worth looking into. They probably already support SQL, PHP, and have a PHP MySQL installation. If not, you should check with your IT services about that. If you're not in the university, there are numerous services out there that are offering to provide you with these facilities in terms of a server, PHP, MySQL, MyAdmin, PHP MyAdmin setup for around $5 a month. In some cases, maybe even a little less. In some cases, you can pay more, pay a little more. Uh, I use startlogic.com. Uh, I don't necessarily mean to drive business their way, but I will say that it has met my needs. There are many other options out there for you to compare and contrast, but as a baseline for about 5 bucks a month or about the cost of one video game a year, I'm getting about as much bandwidth as I need, and it meets my needs in terms of PHP, MyAdmin, SQL, and so on. So once you've got that set up, then you need to access PHP MyAdmin, which for start logic is a little bit roundabout. I'll just quickly show you what I do for that. Uh, first of all, we have to log into the custom system, and then here we have an option for databases. Right there, we can create a new database. We give it the username, password, and the name of the database. Note that this password is separate from, in my case, my start logic account. And in a lot of cases, no matter what service you're using, your general server login or information may be different from your, your database password and so on. So you want to you want to jot that down so we have it here in a minute when we set up our page. So in having created the database, now I can click on it and choose to view it in PHP My Admin. And this is this is where this is no longer startup uh, start logic specific. This is now pretty much what you'll see no matter how you're getting to it. And if you're going through school services for this, you'll likely have a special URL to go to to access your PHP My Admin. No matter who your provider is, poke around, you can probably find their way of getting to your database in this fashion. Now once we're inside the database, we need to be able to hand populate it. This is some sample data while we get started, as well as this is also a good way to structure the information so we have something for our PHP to interact with. For starters, let's go to create a new table. And when we're creating a table, it wants to know how many fields there are. Fields are sort of the equivalent in database land of variables to a class in the local programming. So this is how many values you want to keep track of for something. So as, a, as our first table, let's create a table of bad guy or bad guy info. Let's do that. So what do we, what do we want to keep track of? Let's keep track of the name of the bad guy. Let's keep track of how many max gold hit points he has. Let's keep track of how much gold it's worth. We can actually say min gold and max gold, so we can have a range of how much gold we want to return for the person. Uh, you know, let, let's actually leave it at that, because there's going to be other things we want to specify, like attacks or loot drops or something. But I'll show you in a second how we're going to use linking tables to set up a many-to-many -many relationship for that field. So that was only four variables I mentioned. That was min gold, max gold, maximum hit points, and name. There's actually a fifth variable we're going to add. So for every single database table you ever make, you're going to have one extra field in there that's an integer to keep track of just a number for each entry. These numbers are semi-arbitrary. They tend to increment. They'll begin at 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Uh, and what this is important to have this auto-incrementing ID for,
for is that when you are connecting up database entries to other ones, so if we have like user on Facebook and it's photographs of her photographs, you don't want to connect that information to the user's name in case they have to submit a name change or they get married or something. And then you have to reconnect all those connections between the data. So instead we want to have a number for the user and that's a similar number you have to do and sometimes in your URL as you're sort of browsing Facebook. That number is connected to the information in a way that's abstracted from the contents of that entry. So all said and done, we're going to have five fields for this bad guy info section. Now this may look intimidating because there's going to be a lot of these boxes to fill in. The trick is we can ignore most of them, right? There's only a few that really affect us. We care about the variable type and we care about the name of the field. The variable type, there are really only a few of those we need to look at for our purposes. If you're working on large scale databases professionally, there is, there's some real important subtle nuances between these different types. For our purposes, we can pretty much looking as we often do as programmers for integers, for float values, or the equivalent, and for strings, which have slightly different names here, but you'll see those as we fill those in. First of all, fill in bad guy ID, capital I N D, and this will get us an easy connection to stick to for how we number things. This way, with another database entry, at least to reference this one, it can be referred to it by its bad guy ID. We want to set that type to an integer. And instead of filling it in, we're going to have this one auto increment primary key. So it'll set here, which is optional, as you can see I'm doing on the screen. Right, so we're done with that one. Now the next one, we want to name this, let's say, bad guy name. And we'll set the type to var char instead of text. Text allows sort of arbitrary length and is not very efficient, but it's useful if you had like long articles in a database that you don't know exactly how large they're going to be. If you have some idea of an upper bound, so let's say we know we're going to never have a bad guy's name over 50 characters long, then we can set it to var char and we set here the size to 50. And then we also want it to say uh, how many hit points this bad guy has. Let's, let's first play this one with decimal precision so you'll notice what I'm selecting there. And then we'll also select min gold or max gold. We'll set those as integers. Okay, so we've got these values filled in and we click save and now we have that structure there but we don't have anything filling in that structure yet right because there's no bad guys that we were keeping track of information for and so you'll see up here if I mouse over it we can't actually click browse yet because there's no bad guy data to browse so what we have to do for that is we have to go to insert tab and now here under insert we can it's you'll see it gives us fields for putting in two of them we could ignore one let's ignore one the first time and just type in some some values for this so let's uh, we can leave blank that auto incrementing enemy ID it's just going to fill that in based on whatever the next one is available and we're going to put into a name let's say D, maximum hit points 100, gold, min gold, max gold, let's say 60 to 80, just for some numbers, and we'll submit. And you'll see now when we go to browse, now you can see we have our thief data in the database. Keep in mind that at least as we're dealing with it here, this is kind of an enemy description. This isn't a, a specific enemy, so we don't have hit points on them and so on. Uh, but you very well could use a database in that fashion, as Facebook does, to have one real instance per entry. It really just depends on what level of abstraction you want to use. So as it's currently set up, we would be checking the database to find out the stats for this enemy, but not to keep track of the enemy's fate. Um, up to you as to what level of abstraction you choose to use when making databases. So let's go ahead and insert a couple more entries, just for illustration. Let's go ahead and make an orc, and let's make, I don't know, space marine just to kind of mix and match. Give them some health values, give them some min and max gold. Again, leave those auto increment fields blank. We'll press go. All right, so now we have three bad guy types in our database. Something I didn't show yet though, because th so these fields, these are the right way to fill in information about things like where, where you know there's a one-to-one -one relationship between this enemy has one piece of information about its health maximum. This enemy has one fact about its min gold and its max gold. Uh, if we want to have something where there's a many-to-many -many relationship, so if we think about what types of loot does the enemy drop, so if you think about that, any given enemy might be able to drop different types of loot, and any type of loot might be able to be dropped by multiple types of enemies. So for that type of relationship, we're going to look at doing a linking table, and that's something that's sort of slightly more advanced, and it's going to clarify why I, I named these variables things like bad guy name the way that I did in Campus Hunter. So let's create a new table, first of all, for loot. So let's do that. We're going to go back to our top-level database view, and let's create a new table, and let's name that one loot info, as we did with bad guy info. Now we're in the code that we want about loot. Let's kind of keep it simple for now. Let's just say loot ID, and again, it's going to be an auto increment primary key integer. We're going to say loot name, like so. And we could have item info somewhere else if we wanted to store it differently in the database, but for now, let's just go ahead and say like value, so we have something about the value of the drop. Press save. Once again, we have a description now for what, loot, what it means to be loot, but we don't yet have any entries because if we browse over, mouse over browse, you'll see that we can't go in there yet. So we have to go to insert, and over here in insert now, we can fill in a couple of values for loot. Let's go ahead and make a small stack of gold. Leave those auto increment fields alone. They'll get filled in for us. Small stack of gold, let's say it's worth 50 coins. Huge stack of gold, let's make it, I don't know, 500 coins. Let's go ahead and insert some more entries too. 
you know, he's been for so long. And now for the dude, let's say Fire Potion. I don't even know what that is. But let's say it's worth a thousand coins. So for another one, I don't know, Chainmail Armor. And let's say that's worth 800 coins. And now notice, you know, we could uh, press, press done there. We can add a new field now. If we wanted to change how would it we fill that each piece of information. So if we go back to our structure for our section, and we can add a new field on the end. Let's say probability, right? Or so or so chance of being dropped. And, and there's a ton of ways we could deal with this. We could deal with this on the enemy side. We could deal with this differently per enemy. But for now, to keep things simple, let's set it per type of loot. And so if an enemy can drop a certain type of loot, it'll be dropped with this amount of probability. That'll get complicated for us, so we're going to ignore probability of drop for now. But we could add to another field if we wanted to, additional values, and then fill those in by editing the entries. I do want to point also the structure of what's going on with the screen when we're in the browse view, for example, is that each of these in the individual rows corresponds to that entry. If we want to edit it, we can use this button here to pencil. If we want to delete it, we can use this button here to X. You can also put a check mark along the left side, and then along the bottom you have your master commands that allow you to edit multiple at once, delete multiple at once, and so on. Okay, so we have these values for loot, we have these values for enemies. There's currently no connection between them. We're going to create a third table. We'll go back to the database level, add a new table. This is going to be a linking table. And now a linking table is where we line up the those integer IDs we're going to be using for like shield ID, for bad guy ID. This is how we can line them up together if we want a relationship between them. And so this one is only going to have three field values. We're going to call this one loot bad guy link table. Now to give it three fields, each of those is going to be an integer. One is going to be the link ID, auto increment, that's fine for that. So for link table, we're going to keep that primary key uh, as its own sort of auto incrementing field, just as a good exercise. The other two we're going to have as the loot ID and as the bad guy ID. Okay, we create that. We go to browse, pretty much any camp next, there's no values in there. We go to insert now. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take the bad guy ID and the loot ID for any that we want to create a relationship between, right? So let's open up a new tab so that you can kind of control click or command click depending on your OS of choice. These other two tables and browse through their values. And this is this is sort of a clumsy way to do it by hand instead of by using a PHP form, but it will illustrate the point. If we want to connect, we want the thief to be able to drop the chainmail armor, then we'll look at the thief ID number over here. We look at the chainmail armor ID over here. We put those both in there as a new field entry, as, as new entries for those fields for this type of database entry in the in the link link table and let's do another one let's say that the space marine can drop the fire potion or a huge stack of money space, space marine can drop a huge stack of money so we put that integer and that integer over here we do a we, we press go fill in two values let's go ahead and insert a couple more and you can see down here we can change if we want to add even more but let's say the space marine can also drop chain mail click illustration we'll fill in as we see me doing those same integers and then let's say what other bad guy we have we have an orc let's say the orc can drop small bag of money do a little couple, couple more. The orcs can drop a big bag of money. Orcs can drop chain mail. There we go. So we've got some examples now of different bad guys connected to different types of drops. All we see here in the database are these numbers, but again, what's, what's beautiful about this setup is that if we go back in these other entries now and we change the name of the orc, so it's like Mega Orc, or if we decide that our game shouldn't have a space marine for consistency, we can change the name here and our, our connection between the loot and the data for this character isn't lost. Likewise, we can change information about the loot, its value, its, its, its name, etc., and it'll retain the connection between what types of enemies are connected to which types of loot. So this is as much as we're currently doing in PHP MySQL, we're now going to shift to doing things directly in PHP. Now PHP, unlike HTML, typically won't run locally unless you're running a local server. So the way we're actually going to do this is to use your web space to upload files via FTP and then edit those and then be constantly sort of refreshing them on a web browser to, to view our changes. First of all, let's just create a, a, a blank document that had some words in it, some words in it. Okay, name it .php, copy that into a folder you can view from the URL, and then let's refresh that page or let's go to that URL in your browser and you should see there those words. Now if you type something in PHP it'll just show up there but beyond that we can actually start formatting it just like we would HTML. Let's throw in a strong tag, we can throw in an href, anchor tag for a link, we can put in some, we need BRBRs, break lines to separate lines of text. And we, you know, just like HTML, this literally is HTML syntax. We, we can and should really start with HTML, go to slash HTML. All this other business is recognized as valid PHP because PHP includes all of HTML. And now when I refresh this page, let's view over here. There's, there's what we typed. And now the way I've got this set up, by the way, is my FTP client of choice, and there's, this is pretty typical for an FTP client, allows me to directly open the text file in a text editor, make changes and save them. And when it detects a change to the local file, automatically re-uploads those changes to the server. So if you save changes to your file you're editing in FTP and don't see the changes immediately, you may need to instead download the file, edit the file, re-upload it to see your changes take place, but hopefully your FTP client has this set up as it's just, again, pretty conventional. Go make changes and just save and refresh the page. Okay, there's no actual PHP going on there yet. This is still just HTML. Now let's throw in there uh, some PHP tags. These are expected tags, just like a lot of HTML has uh, it's between the left and greater than sign, although here we're going to use question mark PHP 
of t is down to question mark greater than or less than question mark of t is down to greater than. And so anything inside here is PHP code. So this is where you can actually have for loops, if conditionals, functions, classes, variables, all the sorts of things you're used to seeing in programming, we can do here. And if we say echo, and then we quote from a semicolon, and we fill inside here, here is some text, save it, refresh the page, and if it all went right, you should see here some text injected onto the page as though it were HTML. And in fact, if you do a view source on this page, you won't even see the PHP code, you'll only see the echo. So the way that PHP relates to HTML is that it's generating the code for these echo statements, and then we can have driving those different echo statements, for loops, if conditionals, database queries, API calls, to dynamically decide based on time of day, or based on time of month, or based on who's accessing the page, which information gets displayed. So this puts a, a quick for loop into the PHP just to show that we can use code and what it kind of looks like in PHP. You'll see here we have dollar signs for our variables. We don't actually have to declare variables in PHP as we do in other languages, which is a little bit dangerous because be wary of the fact that if you misspell a variable name in PHP, you won't get an error from it. It will just think you've invented a new variable right there. So you got to keep an extra eye out for that. Also as a warning for writing code in PHP, there is no compiler feedback. You might get reasonable errors even if you turn on all the error code feedback and so on you'd like. It'll oftentimes just show you a blank page if it's broken. So be prepared for some hair pulling while you're debugging, which is going to involve a lot of commenting things out. Speaking of which, PHP comments, you can do just like you do in C or C++. You can do slash slash and then some words, or just do a processing. You can do star slash down to slash star, so fill in spaces in the middle, and that'll allow you to comment your code. Or to comment out code, if you're testing something, try to figure out where the problem is. Why is your code showing blank? So we've got a for statement. This will print it out, and you'll see if I stick that dollar sign I in this statement, then we can actually show over here each of those lines being generated, and once again, if you do view source, we don't actually see the PHP, we just see the generated code. This difference here of the fact that you only see the generated code it also allows us to do things like we can have our PHP password directly in the PHP files that customers or clients or players access. It's invisible to them because they can't see the functions we wrote. They can only see the echo that we output. It all actually runs on the server and never gets transmitted down to the visitor's machine. Okay, let's create a form using some basic HTML, a couple of input fields. If you've seen this before in HTML but didn't know PHP, you might have wondered how to make these work, and that's what PHP is for. We're actually going to delete here the PHP section for now. Uh, we're going to have a separate file in a second. So we got a form, and here I've just put the PHP file of which file we want to transmit this information to when it receives it. And so we'll send it to one called receive.php, which we'll create in a moment. And when we refresh the page, if we didn't make any typos, we should see these couple of forms with our labels on them right in front of them like so. And what we're asking for here is we want the enemy's name, we want the enemy's maximum hit points, we want the minimum and maximum amount of enemy gold and we also we're going to soon add check marks here to allow you to add different types of enemy loops to connect to this enemy but we're not going to do that just yet you'll see in a moment how we're doing that this is a post type and so we're going to go to back to our FTP client we're going to duplicate our initial PHP file rename it to receive.php open it for editing inside here we're going to need to catch those post arguments and the way we do that is this kind of funky notation of dollar sign underscore post and here we put in quotes the name of it as always a semicolon at the end and I like to make these equal to local variables first thing so I can avoid this sort of nasty post array access notation all over the place. You technically don't have to. You could just keep these underscore post things everywhere. It drives me bonkers so I like to set them aside into local variables like this. Okay, so we've got these values and now on this receive page, first of all, just to prove to ourselves what, what it is that we're doing, let's try saying echo bad guy name, okay? So then let's provide a link, an ahref. Remember, we don't have to do the echo statement for this. We can do this outside the PHP. Uh, we can just say straight up anchor hypertext reference. Uh, let's go back to index.php. If you're not familiar with why you're using index.php as a name file, name that's the file that's assumed by a browser if you don't specify the file name for a folder so this is kind of like the correct name universally almost for the default page in a folder okay so now if we go back to our form we should be able to type in bad guy name um, Dorito and we put in some words over here uh, so there's some placeholder values we press submit we should see on this next web page the word Dorito what we put in for our bad guy and that's showing us that this information got passed from that form to this other PHP file which in a moment we'll be able to integrate into an SQL call to save that as a new bad guy in our database all right, so let's go back to that page, back to the first page. Let's take another look at our receive PHP file code. And now in here, uh, we're going to add a SQL insert call. And this will sound kind of funky if I say it out loud, so I'm just gonna show you here with the query DB all we're gonna do. Actually, speaking of which, uh, let's let's go ahead and make a, a new third file, uh, if we can borrow this canvas for a second. And you may just wanna download this from my page. I encourage you to type it, but if you're finding something with typos, it's gonna be important to, to just t download mine, perhaps. Now, query DB is this really straightforward thing. I modified off somebody else's random code off the web. It's basically, just a way to submit a query to the database and have it catch the error codes if something goes wrong. 
because there's a lighter weight way to do database queries in PHP where you basically just sort of connect to the database, send a query, and hope it works. Fortunately, if anything goes wrong with that, if your password's wrong, if the database stuff is wrong, if, if it can't access it, if you're offline, whatever the case is, you won't actually get the error feedback. So I like to use this as sort of my go-to reusable chunk of code for PHP. Uh, you'll force me to change here your username and your password. Those, of course, are not my real username and password for my database. Don't be kidding me. Uh, but you do need to customize those. Otherwise, this will all sort of work for you as is. And remember that because this is wrapped in PHP, it will not be visible to the outside world. It will only be visible to you, but allow you to call this function. And now in order to call this function from this other file, we're going to do a, an include in PHP. This is sort of a, uh, we out of TA, we call it a poor man's modularity, uh, in that we can write this function in one place and then reference it in multiple files. So if you're if you need a second to copy that, you can. You may be able to pause the video. It makes sense for me to stop in here for four minutes while you copy that code. Or again, you can copy it off my website, Copy Game Dev, where this PHP SQL tutorial entry is. So you've got that now in your file, and that should also be up on the server, querydb.php, and the same folders, index.php and receive.php. Now back to receive.php, we're going to do that include of querydb. And now we can do what I was going to say, which is this insert call. And so we're going to do a querydb. We're going to tell it to insert into which table, which value. Uh, and this, what's going inside your source here is SQL notation. This is separate language from PHP. This is, in fact, if you pay close attention while we're using PHP MyAdmin, every time we do any operation over there for browsing, for inserting, for updating, for deleting, it actually shows you which PHP calls are being used. So that's one way to learn SQL. Otherwise, there are a ton of resources out there on the web documenting different ways to use insert, select, update, uh, and so on for databases, some of which are pretty rudimentary and common, some of which are extremely esoteric and complex. But we're just going to cover some basic ones today because I kind of take my word for it like this is what PHP and SQL look like when they're wrapped. So we've got this SQL call that's going to insert these values. And now pay attention to the order of these. So we put in no value for the auto incrementing ID because we want that to be trusted to the database. These other ones are filling in. And this is in the same order. If we go back to browse the PHP in our browser for our bad guys, this is the same order that those variables are being requested in is the order that we're passing them in to this insert call with SQL. Okay, so we save that and we go back, type in some values here. Let's put in warm X. Let's give it some values for these different numbers and now we press submit you will see there no feedback yet because we didn't give any feedback but if we press return and we go back to the mysql browser we will refresh this page and if all went well you should now see warm x listed in your database right which is kind of cool right this is a way that someone could in the olden days list things in your guest book it's a way that still people post things on your wall uh, it's using a form to input and update and save information permanently online in a way that's accessible from other pages what we're going to show you next is how to access this information from another page by the way if you're having any errors at all uh, you'll see a blank php page best i can tell you is to try competitions out until you see it working again it may kind of get your head on straight but it's like i said debugging this stuff is a bit of a pain so we don't get the break lines like we do with the local local builds you know what let's not do this as a separate page for listing i changed my mind let's do this right in index.php let's do a listing of the page so it's include over here query db don't forget to include this since if we're going to call it we can't just expect the program to know to look for it so over here we've included query db we're going to do uh, we're going to save the value of the query db into this other thing let's say enemy results equals query db now we're going to do the select call select is how you tell the database i want certain information about certain entries based on certain criteria and so you could specify like all facebook users who have joined since um, december 2008 or you could say all users or all bad guys who are worth at least 500 gold and also have a name that starts with a b right so there's, there's all these ways we can specify what it is we want from the database and it'll give it back to us in an insanely optimized very efficient manner and so but here we're just going to say we want all the information we can get about the bad guys info we just kind of want all of it we don't we're not being too picky right now okay and now we have to do something with that we have to use we're going to do this while loop that's going to get one entry at a time out of that set of results so that set of results isn't yet usable that's actually just the collection information because there's two things we could call on that we could call rows on it and find out how many entries are in it which is all we want is a bad count of how many bad guys there are in fact let's start by doing that let's say echo okay i'll throw in this rows call on those results comment that out and let's put at the start of this how many bad guys there are colon and notice here i use a period periods are how you concatenate strings in php not plus signs plus signs will mess you up and give you like the number zero as a result that period is how you add together strings in php unlike before where i could just stick that dollar sign i in that for loop here we need to concatenate these with a period because this is a function call and not itself a variable name and so php would be less able to kick this out as a random string of hash and know what we meant by the dollar sign in front of things of course if you want a dollar sign there's ways to, to, to escape those out okay we refresh the page it'll say that we have this many bad guys and you can double check in your database is that how many bad guys we think we have and it sure better be okay so now let's change that from a rows call and then let's go back to what we were doing here with this while loop where we're sort of fetching entries one at a time and now let's print out some information about them you know we could do this all kinds of pretty ways but we're 
just going to use commerce for now and be lazy about it. Uh, we could format this really beautifully and go like, okay, we'll just create strong tags around the enemy's name and the enemy can spray. You know, the range of gold we'll express is with a dash between it. Hit points, HP colon, and let's call this victory. We don't actually need to list the enemy's ID number, of course. While we're at it, let's be a little fancy and jump here and, and order by, by bad guy name. So this will alphabetize the names and it gives back to us. This is an example of one of the many ways you can sort. We can sort them by value, uh, how much they're worth, and so on. Well, let's, let's sort them, let's just alphabetize them. Now we refresh the page. We will see, thanks to our breakdown, sort of spreading things out. Here's our monsters that we currently have in the database. So we can, and now we can test and try to see, let's add a new one. Let's add Bill Gates and give him some values and stuff. Press submit, go back to the page. There's class here ways to do this and what we're doing here, but the point is hopefully getting across. And here you see, now we have an ENT in our database and we don't even have to check in PHP, my admin, because we're showing it to ourselves here in a, in a pretty handy way. Now though, we want to use that linking table to say what kinds of loot are available to attack the bad guy. And so what we can do for that is, so there's two ways we can go about this. We could, within each bad guy, do an, an MySQL select and find out of these two tables, so we have the enemy's ID because that's the entry that we're currently on. And we can do a search for all the entries in the loot table for that ID. And then we could do a search for all of the corresponding loot information for those IDs. But we can actually do a join call that'll do these together. So we do multiple sort of searches at once. And we'll show you the example code for that. And this is effectively combining that table's information so that when we search for it by monster ID, we're getting back these sort of paired results. And it seems a little crazy, but apparently that's what kind of what's going on over here. So there's their information together so we can see which information is available in terms of loot for each bad guy. If we want to be able to choose which information we want to add per bad guy, then let's add some radio buttons. Or not a radio button, because we have multiple guys covered per bad guy. Let's add checkboxes to this page. And we're going to use a select call on the loot database to get the names of each kind of loot. We can list here as options. Let's sort our loot by value, like how much it's worth. We're going to add a regular code for that. We can even sort of test these that loot's information so we can make choices about it. Doing like so. And this is this is just more information we put into the form data using HTML tags. And now when we refresh this page, you should see there a listing of all the loots we have. And of course, we needed to hook up over here in the receive to use that additional field data that we're getting from those checkboxes based on those values to create those link entries for the different uh, watch here that are that are out of these ads. So once again, I can verbalize this kind of silly way that you just sort of code out loud and see it visually on the screen. And as is often the case, you know, you can download again all the source from hobbygamedev.com under the PHP MySQL extension. Now we can refresh it once again. Okay, there we go. So now let's add a new type of bad guy. Let's say goblin, and let's give him a couple types of loot, values. And we go back, we should there see the information. And of course, that receives page can and should be giving us feedback on if there's an error or something. So we could, for example, try to add another goblin, something we should already exist. Goblin, we just learned some gibberish, gobbledygook. And yeah, there we go. So now it's what we need to do instead is do a check. This is where in the receive call, we can check and see if that entry already exists. Let's go, let's just do that. It's a good exercise. Let's go to receive.php. First of all, we're going to select and see, does one exist by this name? And if it does, then we're not going to allow it. And we're going to update the information for that one instead. The updating information is a pretty straightforward call to update for the fields. It's going to be a little more indirect for the link table because we're going to have to kill the previous entries and then maybe recreate the ones that have been checked. So there you have it. We've got database, which we can view and modify in phpMyAdmin. We've got a form that can manipulate it as well as display the contents of it. We've got some PHP that's doing that for us. Of course, you know, sky's the limit. There's a million ways you could go with this. Databases are extremely heavy duty, complicated subjects to become an expert in. I am, like I said, barely scratching the surface here. I'm just trying to get you sort of your feet wet so you're ready when the chance comes up to combine some of those historical examples. You're kind of grounded in how to get started. There's probably some database experts out there wincing at some things I suggested here today. Maybe even some PHP experts wincing at things I suggested today. I'm just trying to get you into it. If you've got questions, I can try to answer them. As always, feel free to let me know at hobbygamedev.com or send me an email, hobbygamedev at gmail.com. Or of course, like Eliana, you're the one who gives it to me. And thanks for checking it out. Hope this has been helpful. PHP is useful for all kinds of stuff. You can also use it to access APIs, call outside functionality if you want to get information from someone's Twitter feed and pull information from someone's Facebook account. Uh, there's all kinds of powerful things you can do with PHP to link it not just to your game, but to link it to the outside world and maybe use that to mediate the outside world in your game. As mentioned in the previous entry about why learning PHP, it's also useful as a mediation between SQL calls in your game. So theoretically, you can do calls directly to SQL databases from inside your, your ActionScript Boost Swift or from inside your C++ program. You really should never, ever do that. The reason is that it's really easy for someone to pick apart that network interaction and identify there and manipulate those database calls to break user-generated content, to cheat, to submit in false scores, and so on. It's far better to instead have that information go through a PHP file that actually
back to the gatekeeper, that can give us a great check sum or time stamp, further sort of indication of identifying is this information legit, and then using that to screen and, and, and feel the interaction between the database and your program. So that's another use of PHP. It's certainly not covered today, uh, but now that you have an idea of how SQL kind of works and how PHP can interact with it, hopefully you're a little better set up to get to get to the next level of the step. Another thing to look into, kind of on your time, since we're running out of time today, is get arguments in PHP. We dealt with post coming from the form. You can instead set things to get, and you'll see that they show up in the URL instead of being invisible. This is handy if you need someone to be able to save as a bookmark or directly link into a particular set of calls or information, say to certain search values or so on. We can get parameters for that, but kind of out of time for today. Thanks for checking it out. Good luck with it. I uh, hope you continue to explore what you can do with these web technologies. As I've been saying, they're really not that hard compared to some of the low-level OpenGL graphics kind of stuff you guys typically deal with anyway for your video game work. Uh, Chris Elion for Hobby Game Dev, signing out. Thanks.